Welcome to episode 244 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and today you're going to learn everything you need to know about data centers. Actually, data centers are very important, and we're going to learn from somebody who is a world expert on this topic. Before we begin, I want to say thank you for Livestream. Livestream is a great supporter of CXO Talk, and if you go to livestream.com, slash CXO talk, they will give you a discount on their plans. So I'm so thrilled to welcome back to CXO talk, Kim Stevenson, who is a senior executive at Lenovo responsible for data centers. Previously, she was the CIO, the chief information officer at Intel and general manager of the IOT group at Intel. Kim Stevenson, welcome back to CXO talk. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Kim, uh, everybody knows the, the Lenovo brand name, but I think we tend to think about laptop computers, but, but Lenovo is much more than that. So please tell us about Lenovo. Yeah, so um, certainly the Lenovo ThinkPad brand is the iconic laptop um, out there. And, um, but Lenovo is actually made up of three business units. Um, the PC division, uh, which is where the ThinkPad is, the mobile group division, which is phones, and, uh, and then the data center group. And um, so we're the third largest data center um, provider in the industry. And we, um, you know, uh, just recently um, had, you know, in certain geographies reached number one. And so it's been, um, you know, uh, couple year journey for the company uh, to build the data center group, but we're, um, we're building it. And I think we're in 160 countries now. So we continue to uh, try to grow and expand. Well, certainly Lenovo is an enormous company. So, so tell us about your role at Lenovo and how is this different from what you did previously at Intel? Yeah, well, so I started May 1st at Lenovo, and um, I am the senior vice president in charge of our data center infrastructure products. So what you, you know, classically you would say, you know, servers, network, storage, but all of the equipment that runs in our data centers. And um, it's, for me, it's a, it's a great transition because I was, you know, um, the CIO at Intel for uh, four and a half, five years, and um, running data centers, and now I get to be on the front end of uh, designing the products that go into the data center to optimize the performance of the data center in total. So it's a good, it's a, it's basically going to the other side of the table for me, and it's a good 360 degree view of the market. So you, you were one of the top CIOs in the world, and now you're on the other side of the table, so to speak, how is it different? It must be very different, but there must be some similarities. So how, how is it different? Well, well, thanks one for the compliment. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, it's different because um, I would say when you were the CIO, what you are, you're the applier of technology. We would, we would take technology and we would apply it in use and drive value for the business. Um, we're now on the business side, building the technology, we have to be the creators of the technology. So we have to look pretty far out into and understand the trends that are going to change the needs of the data center equipment. And you see, um, we're at this, it's particularly, you know, sometimes you say you're lucky, sometimes you say you're good, but I purposely wanted to make the move now because data centers are at such an inflection point that the, um, the change in what is a data center, how you architect it, um, where the value comes from, whether it comes out of a public cloud or your own data center, all that is in this big shift that's going on right now. And frankly, it's exciting to be part of a team that gets to define where that direction goes in order for businesses to optimize their value through the deployment of technology. Kim, when you say that data centers are at an inflection point, can you elaborate on that? One is there's obviously um, the cloud, right? And, and whether you own data centers now or you um, 
uh, choose to run workload in a public cloud. And if you follow sort of the news in this space over the last five years, most um, you know industry analysts and pundits and stuff, I, I remember reading news articles that said, you know, who would want to own a data center? Why would you want to do that? Move everything to the cloud. And there are indeed set of workloads that are, I think are what I call classic enterprise workloads, HR, ERP, CRM, that should be run in the cloud because they are a design once, use many. So every company needs a customer relationship management. Every company needs HR. So somebody can design that and many people can use it. And that is the type of workload that should be run from a public cloud um, so that you get the most innovation possible there. The other type of workload that every business has is workload that's unique to your company. And the unique to your company workload is where you create value. When I was at Intel, I would tell you those workloads were engineering and manufacturing because we designed semiconductors and then we manufactured them. And those were the foundational principles of how we got paid. And every company has that. <clears throat> so the shift so is you're splitting your workloads. You're sending certain workloads to the cloud and then you got to run certain workloads on your premise versus thinking everything goes to the cloud. Now, the big underpinning of when you run it on your own premises and you're in your own data center, whether you're renting it or owning it is not really the point. What you have to do is to deliver the service in a cloud model because fundamentally cloud gives you um, both speed and scale. And the original reason why people needed to go to the public cloud is because they had underutilized assets. I think I'll say 2012, 13 in that range, um, data centers ran at on average about 20 to 25% utilization. No other asset in your business would you buy enough of that asset to only use 25% of it. And so, and the reason that that was happening is because those discrete pieces weren't well integrated. So you had servers, you had storage, you had network, and they were all discrete pieces. And today, the part of the architectural shift that you're seeing is a great level of integration. So it used to be data center providers like us would expect our customers to integrate those pieces. And today, we largely deliver those pieces in an integrated fashion. And that takes a great responsibility off of the customer that allows them to take their investment dollars and drive value into those workloads that you know you ultimately get paid for by your customers. So it's those are the sort of things I believe are foundational um, behind the shift that we're seeing. So this is primarily then a CIO discussion about how to divide up cloud versus our public cloud versus internal data center computer workloads what are the the impacts on the business so i would say not exactly okay because the again over the last five to seven years what you've seen is more and more technology is purchased outside of the it organization and people used to think that that was bad. They would think that, well, I think we called it shadow IT or rogue IT. We came up with you know, labels that were negative. But the reality is the reason those things happen, the reason a sales team buys licenses of Salesforce is to get some form of efficiency. The reason um, a marketing team buys a digital marketing platform or a finance team buys an investor relations platform um, is to make their business more of what they do, more and more efficient and effective. So, so it's not just an IT organization statement, right? It really is a business statement. I, I would tell you that today, data centers are the engine of business, right? Whether it's workloads to acquire new customers and grow the company or workloads that drive efficiency into um, the operations of the company. and um, but you can't run a business today without um, a great data center operations. And you know, with the same level of asset utilization, reliability um, that you would expect of any other of your business functions. 
So what are the, the you're giving us a, a kind of tutorial on data centers and what what are the components for those of us who are not experts in data centers? What are the components of data centers and why does this matter to us as users? Yeah, sure. So I would say um, there, there are two things that, so to let the technical people worry about all the technical details, but there's two things every business person should be thinking about when it comes to data centers. One is how well do my business processes execute? So that could be order to cash or procure to pay, but how well do we execute so that um, we become the most efficient and effective? And the second thing is the data itself, the, you know, who owns the data, how do I monetize the data, how am I going to govern that data, um, because today's data provides us so much more about our uh, capabilities around our business decisions than we were ever able to analyze in the past. Um, and so, and that's where you get into the discussion of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Um, it really is about driving um, better business decisions because you have insight into what your data is telling you and you're able to marry your data with, you know, I always say weather data, zip code data, public data to get greater and greater insights. So let's come back in a moment to this notion of artificial intelligence applied to data centers, because I think it's it's very interesting. But we have a question from Twitter. Arsalan Khan is asking, uh, what about the what's happening in the greening of data centers and how it affects uh, the business to reduce energy consumption? So I think that's an important point. So let's talk about it, that. Yeah, yeah. So um, that that's a very important point. And what you'll see is generation to generation, um, each technology generation gets effectively better power usage. Um, and it's, it's everything from your uh, power distribution units, bringing in the power into the data center, and then the equipment, the server storage network devices that use power in the data center. And so um, um, we, there is a measure, um, it's called PUE, of data center efficiency. And that's how efficient the data center runs, um, uses its power. And um, most uh, all of people that are data center managers track that and drive improvements to that power efficiency metric um, each and every generation. And so some of it's through density, some of it's through um, uh, fuller utilization, you know, when you when you have idle equipment there, you're drawing power, but you're not actually using it for anything. And some of it's through the architect architecture itself. You know, um, we had hot aisles, cold aisles, chimney stacks. We've we've done all sorts of things in the data center architecture to uh, worry about airflow. So if you think about what consumes power, you know, it's largely about how air moves in that data center. And so the greening of it has been, you know, if I had to put one umbrella over it, which is slight exaggeration, but um, it is how to better move air through the data center so that you use as little as possible to keep that data center at a temperature that is um, appropriate for the equipment. When you're thinking about the investment in data center equipment design, how do you how do you allocate that? So so what percentage, for example, is applied to uh, energy efficiency? What percentage is applied to security? What are the what are the big buckets that you think about? Yeah. So so the you know we we first start with um, a prioritization when we think about the so we're thinking you know right right now so we just announced a, a product line and that's out there but. Now we've announced it. We're, you know, shipping it in a couple of weeks. So now we're already shifted to thinking about what are the requirements for our next generation. Um, and the first thing we look at is um, workloads, the type of applications that run, and what are the characteristics of that application. So, um, and where do we think that's going? So, and and we'll look at that, and that will give us a sense for the amount of power and performance that's needed, the amount of uh, input output from uh, 
the, um, the IO devices, the storage devices, and the amount of network, how much traffic are you going to consume? And you know, there is a history line that shows all of those things growing at a certain rate. So, so we'll look at that and we're, we'll make a judgment call on whether we think that that trend line accelerates or decelerates based on application types. And it'll guide our different portions of the product family with that. Then the next thing we look at is the, um, the physics required to deliver something at that level. How big should it be? What's the thermal envelope? Um, you know, what form factor will it need to fit in best? You know, because you could have it in a tower or a rack or um, as we think about IoT, you know, we might have to put servers at the edge, um, which won't sit in a data center. So that'll cause some different physics for us. Um, and then the third thing that we look at is we look at, you know, what integration capabilities do we need? And security is a piece of integration capabilities when you're thinking about um, how that's going to run. And, and there's a soft, most of that is a software discussion because that's where our management stack comes in. That's where um, the, uh, the middleware, what we call middleware, would reside as we think about, you know, how best are we going to get the full asset utilization in a secure container type of model um, around that. So, so that's the kind of the sequencing that we go through. And um, before we ever put pen to paper and start any form of engineering. That's interesting. So, so when you talk about the physics, it's not uh, just designing chips, but it's the physics of the the packaging of the boxes and the airflows and the things that will increase efficiency and uh, affect cooling, for example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you mentioned AI, and I think AI applied to data centers is not something that would be on kind of the tip of the tongue of most people. And so, 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 please tell us tell us about that because I, I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so, um, you know, look, when, when I think about what the big picture of artificial intelligence, you know, you're going to have, um, certainly people are going to write artificial intelligence applications, you know, to um, run some form of, you know, create some form of product. Um, but, but a lot of artificial intelligence is going to be modules, if you think about sort of mini applications built into existing enterprise business processes. And so if you think of the data center as a business process, um, you, so one of the things that you do in a data center um, on a regular basis is you patch and update your equipment. So, you know, the software vendors provide um, a new update, the hardware vendors provide drivers, and you've got to patch that environment. And the extraordinarily difficult thing about that, because it sounds like it's easy, um, but in a data center, it's not like a, a PC. A PC, you turn off at some point in time, and those patches can be downloaded and you can stay updated and secure. In a data center, that runs 365 days a week, um, you know, 52 weeks a year, you know, it just never goes down. And more and more um, businesses can't afford to take time in the data center. So how do you patch what seems like a simple thing? Well, if you think about the application of AI in there, uh, an artificial intelligence program could run and find those minute periods of time where that server is idle and patch it right then, patch it live. Um, and possibly even test it before it brought it back online. And so you won't, you, the idea and the concept of downtime can go away because while you're up 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, there are no, there's not even workflow workload during that, that period of time. And so you can find these microseconds, if you will, of downtime through machine learning. Humans can't see it, right? But a machine could see it and then the machine can process things to do it. And, um, and I can see a huge benefit for that. You know, you're, you're in a constantly secure environment that way. You're taking no people's time to be able to stage and plan. plan. Most downtimes, by the way, are taken on weekends and holidays 
And so data center teams work over weekends and holidays to be able to do that so that they don't disrupt the business. Well, if AI was doing in a machine learning algorithm, you know, you wouldn't have to do that. So I think there's a work-life balance thing buried in there somewhere too. So, so where are we in terms of this AI technology applied to data centers? So you're, so you're basically saying that it divides up the, say the patching job or the testing job into microsecond bursts and then strings them strings those microsecond bursts together in order to eventually come up with a completed patched outcome or tested outcome. Yeah, yeah. So, well, look, we're, I would say we're at the very beginning. You, you are seeing intelligence built into data center equipment today. Um, and, and it has been at the rudimentary level there for a long time because, you know, um, some servers have had call home capability for a long time. Um, but now you see intelligent care given and you see management stacks of software that continue to add intelligence into the system. And that's good. Um, but, you know, there's still a ways to go before you can get to that true um, autonomous data center uh, because you've got to get to the point where you can distribute software in these mini microservices, you know, mini containers so that you're not actually um, disrupting the business operations. When you have to deliver something in its um, big, you know, big load, the whole payload at one time, it actually, it just takes more time to do versus, you know, if you're able to do it in these uh, micro uh, services manner. So, so we've got applications that need to be modernized, um, as well as the full intelligence capability to be built into the equipment. But it's well, we're well on their way as an industry and, um, and you can see it coming. And we have another question from Twitter. Scott Weitzman is intrigued with this AI question. He works for a company called IPsoft, which makes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, AI based, products for, for IT automation. And so he's wondering, is it just to, is AI just used as a fix or do you see it in the data center somehow doing something more that's directly adding value to the business? I certainly, I think fixing things or preventing things from needing to be fixed is probably a better way to say it, is a large part of improving operational efficiency in the data center, but that's only a part of it, right? And, and the other part would be provisioning new services so that you get to value quicker. And, um, and we're well on our way in that area. Um, so if you think about orchestration and provisioning and um, all the things that have happened that used to be, let's see, um, maybe, maybe seven, 10 years ago, it would take, you know, basically 90 to 120 days to get your data center equipment um, planned, ordered, and delivered, and then set up in your data center. So four months, right? And now we do that today by click, 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 right? And in 30 minutes, you have that set up. And that's largely what a cloud architecture has given. So now you say, well, let's take that to the next level, right? And why do I need to click, click, click? Why can't my, when I'm ready to deploy my application, my application has intelligence built into it that it automatically can pull the resources. Um, and so then you truly have seamless, right? And again, it's about time to market for new capabilities because no capability delivers value until it's fully in production. And so shrinking that time to get it fully into production, you know, we're, we've made great progress, but there's still more to be done to further, um, you know, autonomize that kind of workload. Um, and, and I think, again, you know, that's a really exciting part of where we are in this industry right now. When you talk about time to value in data centers, Maybe just uh, put a finer point for us on what that means. What are the key, what are the key things that the, that your customers care about regarding this issue? Yeah. So so um, 
speed and scale. Those are always going to be my sort of thing. They, they care about, um, you know, how fast can they get a capability um, deployed and being used by the business. Um, and so, and then they also care about, can I scale it to the level that gives me the proper economics? So we'll, we'll say it in terms of uh, TCO, total cost of ownership. Um, so those are usually the two measures. And the more that we can scale, right, the better the economics are. And so, so that's where things are, you know, you want multiple workloads to run on the same infrastructure. So you want your infrastructure in the data center to be um, universally uh, usable. So it doesn't matter what application, I can run that, um, uh, all those app all applications on this same kind of infrastructure that allows me to scale it, scale it in such a way that I get the best possible economics. So again, I go back to what I said earlier, when you design once, use many, you get better economics. And so um, you have to think about that as the new infrastructure design, you know, design once, use many, many applications using the same infrastructure. I'm going to ask you to now put on your CIO hat. So this then, so this div dividing up between the say the bespoke applications that provide unique value for a business versus the packaged applications that everybody is using, you know, CRM, ERP, what have you. How, it, it seems like a, like a challenging job, almost an enterprise architecture job for the CIO or the CIO's team to make those decisions, but there's also a very strong business component determining, do you have unique value in a particular process or should it just be standardized? This is a very hard problem. Right, it, it really is a business architecture that has to be done. So, you know, there are companies, like I said earlier, that your customer relationship management should be run in the cloud because somebody's going to design it for you and many people can use it and you'll get innovation the best way. So that sounds reasonable. But if your value is customer service, right? So think like Zappos is one of my favorite, right? You know, Zappos has great customer service. So would you will you just use a plain vanilla package or do you have to enhance that package? to live to the value proposition of your company. So it really becomes a business architecture. You know, where are you gonna make money? How are you gonna make that, right? What's the brand reputation that you're building, right? And aspiring to. Um, and then all of the IT systems and architecture have to flow out of that business architecture. Is, is this something that businesses struggle with or, or do most companies have enough uh, the tight working relationships between business and IT that they know how to do this well, or what are the kind of challenge points that that you see companies have in making these these decisions? Yeah, so I, I think if I had to pick one word, frustration is probably the most common feeling that business people have with IT, um, and it's it's speed, right? That the business leaders are pushed and pushed and pushed to deliver on some element of a strategic plan each and every month, each and every day, each and every quarter. And when you get a you know timeline from IT that says I can do that for you in a year, um, that just they it creates a lot of frustration. Um, now that said. Um, a lot of the capabilities that are now available using a cloud delivery architecture, using um, you know, uh, applications modeling that would de develop in containers and microservices, reusing a lot of that code in a DevOps model, all of these things, all the new methodologies actually are implied in the methodology that an IT team would use is close integration with the business. Um, and, um, and I believe that's mandatory because there are, there are things that um, an IT organization will be able to um, ensure that your application and, and your data center environment is secure, 
um, uses the same sign on. So you're not using, you know, I know it sounds silly, but, but if you have a, you know, customer application and you expect them to sign in one way on a mobile device and one way on a PC, you're going to make them mad. And so, you know, IT is the place where you're going to, they're going to have thought through and have an architecture that makes that seamless from a customer perspective. And it's not just customers, it's employees. Employees don't want um, to sign in on multiple uh, ways. And so, so it really, there's, there's lots of good um, reasons why business and IT need to be connected very tightly um, and aligned on that strategic execution plan. It's also why I say IT should be measured on the business results. Um, and, and as you know, I produced a, you know, an annual report at Intel and Intel IT still produces that annual report, which really articulates the value that IT delivered um, to the business, much like a 10K would for the business value that was created for shareholders. It's the same concept. We have an interesting comment from Twitter. Daniel Vaughn says that all of these issues are because business and IT don't have a shared purpose. Maybe you can re react to that comment. And there's, I think there's truth in what he's saying. I, I don't think it's intentional though. That's the, the irony of it. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt, but absolutely. You know, we don't have, everybody has the best of intentions and wants to do the right thing. That's right, that's right. And um, so, but you know, there's sort of, I divide decisions, right? Um, that the company needs to make into who should who should be the decision maker, and then who should play uh, an approver role or an inputter role, a performer role. Um, and there are decisions that IT should make. Um, and and a, a good example would be network size, right? No one person in the company is going to be able to assess the totality of the network needs to make the right decision. So IT as a central body should make that decision. But on a business business application, so I'll, I'll use HR this time. I'll try to not pick too much on one workload, but HR. So HR will say, you know, I've got to pay people. I've got to hire people. I have to train them. I have to do all these things as an HR leader. Well, HR best knows what, how many hires they're going to have, and therefore what capacity they might need to do a certain level of hiring and the locations they might need to hire and the skills they're hiring for. And so unless they work really closely with IT, I, if IT tried to do that, develop a new application for that, without that deep insight from HR, like you would get misaligned. Um, and the most commonplace misalignment happens is in user experience, right? How, what is it like to use the PC, to use the application? Um, and, you know, simplicity is great, but it's actually very hard to deliver. And um, so, but it is something I look, we, we need to work on uh, joint objectives, joint alignment, and therefore let that drive the IT agenda. Um, but it, it comes from the business's uh, strategic plan that should drive the IT agenda. And, <clears throat> excuse me again, and how does all of this, as you're thinking now of uh, data centers, how does all of this play back or feed back into the, your thinking about the design of data centers? So I would say, um, you know, we've been over the last five years consumed with moving workload to the cloud. And we've done as an industry, a great job of de de um, defining and deploying hyperscale data centers that they're, they're enormous. They're you know, using things like water or power and stuff, solar. And so they're, they're tremendously efficient. Um, and uh, you see a lot of workload moving in that direction. But now as we get to this shift part of what's happening and companies start to invest heavily in IoT type of workloads, artificial intelligence type of workloads that are gonna be unique to their company, um, their own data center 
um, starts to take a rise in importance. Um, and we're sort of hitting that point this year. Um, and there's where the, you know, what we're trying to do is uh, make it as simple as possible to deploy uh, IT equipment into that data center. So the, the integration is tightly, uh, more tightly integrated. Um, but we also want, I said earlier that, you know, we have a history of IT assets having a low um, asset utilization, which would be unacceptable on any other class of asset. And so one of you know, the other things we're trying to do is add flexibility and we call it future proofing, future proofing your assets so that you know, when the next fast drive storage device comes out, you can, you can change the drive. When the next processor comes out, you can change the processor without having to buy a whole new piece of, of rack um, to do that in. And, um, and it also goes back to, you know, there's gonna be no downtime. So um, think of the work involved to roll out a big piece of equipment, roll in a new one, kick, connect it to the network, pull all the cables, all of that that's involved with it versus I'm gonna open a drawer in my rack, take out a component, put a new component in, close the drawer, I'm done. Um, and so we're really thinking through how do we future-proof that asset so you get the highest return on investment for that asset with the most amount of flexibility and then ultimately reliability uh, because there's, there's just no downtime windows allowed anymore. Okay, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have uh, an important topic being raised by, <clears throat> excuse me, by Janae Sharp, and I hope I'm pronouncing her first name correctly. And she asks, how can we foster gender diversity and how would you use data centers to promote women in tech? And I think this is a very important topic and I'll just tell everybody uh, that, well, obviously, I was gonna say, obviously you're a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I think we have common ground in agreeing on that. I'll just let you. I'll just stop putting my foot in my in my mouth and let you answer the question. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you know, it's um, uh, I, I'm in a, a a first of a time situation right now, which is um, half of the staff. My boss. My boss is the president of uh, uh, the data center group, um, and half of his staff are women. And um, it's, it's a good place to be from my perspective, but it's, it's really interesting because um, uh, all come from very different backgrounds um, and, and all, we're all sort of experts at different parts of uh, the data center business. And um, so it's really easy in that environment to collaborate and draw on each other's expertise. So, um, and I think that is sort of a more feminine trait to collaborate better um, versus, you know, I'd say, you know, drive expertise, siloed expertise. So, um, so I do think having more women on the team is drives better outcomes. Time will tell with us. But, um, you know, I also think it's part of our responsibilities as leaders, women and men, right, to think about how do I get the best from the talent that I have, creating you know, the right leadership environment where everybody is able to um, achieve their personal potential, but also you know, um, tell the next generation, what is it, you know, why is this a good business to be in? Why should you, you know, want to be in it? And you know, we're breaking this, my generation is the generation that broke the mold. Right? It should be easier for all of the women and underrepresented minorities that follow us um, to excel in you know, an um, environment that's going to be very you know, mixed gender, mixed race, mixed cultures. Um, but we have to be respectful of all that. And so, so we spend, you know, at Lenovo, we spend a fair bit of time on the um, uh, education aspect, you know, as kids are coming through school. In fact, I was leaving our um, facility last week and I was walking out with a colleague and I th said, who are those people over there? They're so young. Am I just getting old? And she goes, no, those are the high school kids that we bring in for summer internships, right? And I was like, oh my God, that's, I wish I would have had that opportunity when I was in high school. And so 
programs like that are really fantastic to help um, encourage the next generation to be inventors, to stay into tech. And you got to make sure when you do that, that you get a diverse population and everybody has a role model. The, uh, but particularly uh, data centers, I mean, you were, you've been a woman in very heavily male dominated engineering cultures where it seems like there's even more to overcome, right? I mean, data centers, it's pure geekiness, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, um, I don't think the um, the technical aspects of the job, you know, everybody comes with their, you know, education and then the experience and stuff that allows them to be really, really highly competent in their subject matter. Um, the things that um, we, we're working to overcome in the workplace that actually limit progress are, are more behavioral and, um, and often they're blind spots to the people who, who have them. So, so one of the most common thing, and women talk about this all the time, is that um, you know, people talk over in a meeting, if you're in a meeting, then you know, people talk over one another, all people, not just men, not just women, but then what happens is somehow the woman backs off because she's sort of giving room for somebody else to say something. And then it appears that you actually didn't contribute anything to the meeting when you were trying to be polite. So it's, there are things like that. And we, we call them micro inequities or, or unconscious bias. And you know, we're working really hard to um, train people on what they are, but then you know, safely say, if I said to you, hey, Michael, you know, um, Basically, you just like cut me off. Could I finish? And I can't tell you the number of times in a day I say, would you happen to let me finish my thought before you want to dismiss my thought? But when I finish it, feel free to dismiss it. And then people just go, oh. <laughs> but you do have to call, you have to be strong enough. And this is something that I think that has benefited me greatly. You have to be strong enough to call out bad behavior politely, not, you know, when you see it. And, um, but if you don't call it out, you're not going to change it. And so, so it's a really core part of my leadership principles is that I'm going to tell you if I see something and then we can talk about whether you agree or not, but I'm, at least I'm going to call it out. So we've only got a few minutes left and what advice, so you've just provided advice to women. What advice do you have for companies in order to help uh, promote gender diversity? Yeah, so uh, I would say everyone needs to be an ally. Men and women need to be allies for women, for underrepresented minorities, people with uh, you know, cultural differences. Um, because if you think, Warren Buffett said this in his um, annual report about three or four years ago. He said, you know, the world is made up of half women. Now you wouldn't run your factory half full and expect to get a great outcome. Why would you look at half of the talent base and expect to get a great outcome? You should be looking at the entire talent base and bringing in the best possible people and then helping them become a high performing team. And uh, so, and I really believe that. And so I think that's how companies need to be thinking about it. And um, You've got to look at the whole talent pool and attract the best possible talent and then develop them and promote them through the business. Okay. Kim Stevenson, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. It's been a very interesting discussion and I hope you'll come back another time. I, I hope so. Uh, so thanks for having me, Michael. It's always a great time talking with you. We have been speaking with Kim Stevenson, who is responsible for data center infrastructure at Lenovo. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. Next week, we have two shows on Tuesday and Friday, and uh, we will see you again soon. This has been episode number 244 of CXO Talk. <music>